With over 12,000 cards available for players to choose from, the majority of which saw their initial debut in the anime, you might be inclined to believe that every card from the anime has received a physical print. But the truth is, there are still hundreds of cards from the anime that have never transitioned to the TCG or the OCG. It's almost as though they're being kept hidden. Are these cards simply too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? Today, we're uncovering the secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! Ah, Battle City. Of every format in which Duel Monsters was played throughout the anime, the Battle City tournament remains the one that I want to see happen in real life. Forget playing cards on motorcycles, forget chilling out with the crew in the schoolyard, I want to aimlessly walk around a city and be challenged for the rarest card in my deck, and I say this from a place of love. We've got a tall order today because we're covering every anime exclusive card from the Battle City tournament arc. I was originally going to cover just the villains because they have more than enough to have their own dedicated episode, but we've got plenty of main character additions and this also gives me an opportunity to cover a couple cards that I missed from the Virtual World episode. Grab a snack, kick your feet back, and let's locate these cards. Starting with a villain whose deck, keyword, I enjoyed a lot, especially with his villainous counterpart to Yugi's Dark Magician, but boy oh boy, did I hate the character. Arcana, who not only took inspiration from the Dark Magician, but also John Kramer apparently. Seriously, what the heck was that dual trap? His first card is a classic monster that actually received a retrain in the physical card game, and that is Doll of Demise, a level 4 Dark Fiend normal monster with 1600 attack and 1700 defense. Never really much to say about normal monsters in these videos, but it would have been a decent option in the early formats of the game when this card should have been released, being a well-statted level 4 monster. His next card is Beckon to the Dark, a normal spell card which sends one face-up monster to the graveyard. Keep this exact effect in mind for later, but as a standalone card, it's easy destruction of a problematic monster, and I believe that because of the wording, it doesn't target, which only serves to make this card even better. Being a master of trickery and deceit, it should come as no surprise that Arcana had a couple trap cards exclusive to the anime. Shadow Balance is a normal trap card which can only be activated when your opponent summons a monster and controls more monsters than you do. It then destroys monsters your opponent controls until both you and your opponent control the same number of monsters. This is a great example of why certain cards should have been released during their time in the anime. Nowadays, we have Evenly Matched, which can accomplish what this card does, but better in every way. But it's interesting to see a card from the Duel Monsters era that may have been the inspiration to such a powerful modern staple card. And Arcana's final card piques my interest in how it could potentially be incorporated into the modern game. Nightmare Chains, another normal trap card that can only be activated when your opponent activates a trap card. That trap card is negated, then you target one face-up monster your opponent controls and that monster cannot attack or change its battle position, but it also gains immunity to card effects. If that targeted monster is the only one your opponent controls, the monsters you control can attack directly this turn. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse when I say that these cards would be better in earlier formats of the game with the prevalence of battle traps in those early formats. This card is a perfect counter. With the severe lack of battle traps nowadays, the only trap card you'll be responding to is exactly Infinite Impermanence. On turn 3, so the late game, this card might come in handy. Not having these cards really bugs me. But nothing bugs me more than Insects, which is fitting for the pest that is Weevil Underwood, who had only one exclusive card. Reckless Parasite, a continuous spell card which special summons one Parasite Parasite from your opponent's deck to their side of the field in face-up attack position, which is great because the other means of turboing out Parasite Parasite's unique effect are not stellar. And while we could have stopped there, this card also doubles down on the effect of Parasite Parasite for some reason, treating the monsters your opponent controls as insect type, and instead of 1000 points of burn damage, those monsters can now not be tributed. Every Monarch player disliked that. And these effects last as long as both cards are face up on the field. Every Monarch player really disliked that. Let's look at our last couple of smaller showcases before we get into the damn near booster pack size of lost cards. I was super excited to see that we'll soon be receiving the Earl of Demise, a Bakura classic in the TCG, but that only serves to remind us that Bakura also has nearly an entire deck's worth of anime exclusive cards, two of which came from his Battle City duels. Fearful Earthbound, no, not those Earthbounds, although I'm not even sure if you could use that in this deck, is a continuous trap card which inflicts 500 points of damage to your opponent each time their monsters attack. 
I feel I say this in every episode, but it could be worse, and that statement is firmly grasping onto this card. I mean, it could inflict 400 points of damage. Now that would be terrible. For the safety of all employees at Konami headquarters, if you, watching this video, are an avid Infernity enjoyer, I ask that you plug your ears. Spiritualistic Medium is a normal spell card that requires you to discard all cards in your hand, then one face-up monster you control gains 500 attack for each card discarded until the end phase. Yeah, the OTK feels strong with this one, but we can rest easy because Dark Worlds can't abuse this. Speaking of abuse, a character that I want to step on me is my Valentine. That has nothing to do with her one card for this episode, but I just needed to get it off my chest. Grave Arm, a normal spell card which destroys one monster on the field. Feeling a bit of deja vu, anyone else? Just like Beckon to the Dark, there's not a whole lot of negative that you can put on this card. A one-for-one -one trade that screams I should have been in GOAT format. Let's see what our boys on the main protagonist team are up to. Brooklyn's own has a total of three anime exclusives. Arduous Decision, which I somehow completely neglected in the Virtual World episode, is a normal spell card with the following effect. Pick up the top two cards of your deck and have your opponent select one of them at random. If it is a monster card, you can special summon it and add the other card to your hand. If not, send both cards to the graveyard. Probably the best gamble card in the history of this game. You either get a free summon and a draw, or you get two discards, and while not every deck could play it, this one feels prime for degenerate combos. When I do the research for the- oh crap, uh, Infernity players, you can unplug your ears now. Sometimes I read the effects of these Joey anime exclusive cards and all I can say is, yeah, that sounds about right. And his last two cards were exactly that. Attrition, a do-nothing continuous spell card whose effect can only be activated if an opponent's monster is not destroyed by battle. Yes, that's clearly the optimal result. That monster's attack is reduced by the damage you took from that battle and this debuff is permanent. If you could imagine a Joey card, this fits the bill in about every way. A card that you sit on for the most insignificant effect of your opponent's monsters, but somehow you're able to overcome those troublesome monsters because of this effect. You gotta love it. And lastly, Energy Drain is a normal spell card that has you target one face-up monster your opponent controls and its attack becomes zero. Then you draw one card. Okay, where did that come from? Dropping an opponent's monster to a goose egg was fine on its own, although the targeting effect is less than appreciated, but drawing a card on top of that just feels like we're rubbing salt into the wound. That being said, I will take three copies. Going back to the scoundrels, Odeon, one of Merrick's most loyal servants, got the short end of the stick with his anime exclusives. I say that based on the monster these cards are meant to work with and what we ended up receiving in the physical game. Cup of Sealed Soul and Seal of Circuit, both normal spell cards, share the same effect that when you control the cards Temple of the Kings, Seal of Circuit, and Cup of Sealed Soul, special summon one Mystical Beast Circuit from your hand or deck. These two cards are now completely useless with how Mystical Beast Circuit was incorporated into the game, so they would need a complete rework before being imported into the TCG. And last from Odeon is another example of a card exclusive to a specific character, but it carries the exact effect of another card. Eye of Ujat is a normal trap card with the exact effect of Magical Arm Shield. It can only be activated when your opponent's monster declares an attack, change the attack target to a monster your opponent controls except the attacking monster. I have no more to say about this reskin of Magical Arm Shield than I've said in previous episodes of the series, so we'll be moving on. A duel that I would have been interested in seeing scripted into the anime is Para and Dox versus Loomis and Umbra as a tag duel. I've always wondered who might come out on top. With these cards, I'd personally put my money on Loomis and Umbra. Let's see why. Card Exchange is a normal spell card that exchanges all the cards in your hand with your opponent. Yeah, I hate this. Not because it's overly powerful or anything, but because I hate effects that have players swapping cards in hand. Suddenly I'm getting DQ'd from locals because my white sleeves are considered marked after handing them to the Cheeto dusted meat grabbers of my opponent, who just so happened to sleeve his entire deck in orange, and I'm at a point where I can't tell what's the sleeve and what's grease. The most recognizable cards from Loomis and Umbra were the mask cards, and while we received most of them in the physical game, some of which saw niche success, we actually missed out on some support cards that could have potentially buff them to a competitive threat. Masquerade, a normal spell card which lets you take control of one monster equipped with a mask equipped spell card. In theme, change of heart coming right up. 
Yes, it's more restricted in when it can be used, but overall, a good card. Mask of Impregnability. I mean, I didn't think that I needed to worry about that. A normal spell card which turns all attacks this turn into direct attacks. I feel like we already have something like this in the TCG, but I can't think of the name of it for the life of me. If the game state is right where you aren't worrying about battle traps or your opponent's monster effects that would interfere, this sounds like an effective way to close out a game. Mask Doll is an oddity of a continuous spell card which takes on the effects of mask cards that affect your monsters. I want to give this card the benefit of the doubt and say that it's just the anime's weird wording to say that you don't suffer any negative drawbacks from mass cards if you control this card. Case in point, you no longer have to pay 1000 life points during your standby phase for Mask of Brutality. But that's also the only example and I'd rather just tank the damage. Unless we were missing an anime exclusive mass card, but we're not. We'll just forget about this one. Just like the metagame has nearly forgotten about the existence of trap cards, we have Curse Transfer, a normal trap card which can be activated when your opponent activates a trap card. That's never gonna happen. It's negated and this card's effect becomes the activated trap card's effect. Your options are few and far between for what you can actually use this on. I'd say if it were a continuous trap card that could use the effect of the negated trap card one time while it was face up on the field, that would be an interesting mechanic. Knowing Konami will get it printed exactly how it is, but at least we can negate our opponent's Jar of Greed. On the opposite end of that spectrum, Spell Transfer is a normal spell card that acts like a quick play because it has to be activated during your opponent's turn when they activate a spell card. And then it copies the exact effect of Curse Transfer before a spell card. And this is just infinitely more useful than the previous card. Aside from archetype specific spell cards, of course when you're not in a snake eye mirror match, tier 0 formats and such, the plethora of modern generic spell cards are perfect targets to proc the effect of this card and in turn use it on your opponent. I'd absolutely want to experiment with this card. We've made it to the big three boys, Merrick, Yugi, and Kaiba. Wow, do they have some cards that would be banned as soon as they are announced. Some of these might actually fit the monologue from the intro of simply being too powerful to introduce to today's metagame. Starting with Merrick, and starting with a bit of a crummy monster after that big buildup, Plasma Eel is a level 4 dark machine effect monster with 500 attack and 1200 defense, who cannot be destroyed by battle. And during either player's turn, you can equip Plasma Eel to a face-up monster your opponent controls. That equipped monster loses 500 attack during each of your opponent's end phases, and it cannot be tributed while equipped with Plasma Eel. In the Battle City arc, where it was basically tribute summon your god card or bust, this effect would actually be a problem. But today, July 5th, 2024, who cares? Not even monarchs are upset about this. Dark Wall of Wind is a quick play spell card that if we receive a physical print of, I want its exact anime effect text on that print. Basically, the player activating this card cannot be attacked directly for the turn, which is fine, but the anime text is a work of art. This turn, the player's form is hidden in darkness and does not receive direct attacks from enemy monsters. Absolutely beautiful. Next is Class System, a quick play spell card with an effect that could have been made better if just one word was changed. It can be activated when your opponent's monsters attack your monster and activates its effect. If that monster's level is not greater than your monster's level, negate that attack and effect. If that and was switched to an or, this could have been a great response to archetypal starter monsters, but as is, I'm not sure where this would be most effective, if anywhere. Surprise Attack from Beyond is a normal spell card that allows you to conduct a second battle phase, but only the monsters that were summoned this turn are able to attack. With how monster spammy modern decks are, that's hardly an issue or restriction. You're essentially conducting your full battle phase twice. I like it. Joyful Doom, a normal trap card which can only be activated in response to your opponent's tribute summon. Hell, monarchs are really getting put through the ringer this episode, aren't they? The attack of the tribute summon monster becomes zero and you gain life points equal to the original attack of the tribute summon monster. Arrow Mage players? Thoughts? But I think you're going to have trouble finding a chance to actually activate it. Maybe a solid side deck option. And lastly, what is probably Merrick's best exclusive card, Zombie Jewel. A normal trap card, which can be activated if a spell card is placed in your opponent's graveyard. Be that from activation or discard. You can add that spell card to your hand, then your opponent draws one card. I'm willing to take the risk. If I can secure a spell card from my opponent that can ensure that my following turn will go uninterrupted, be that a lightning storm or dark ruler no more, then I don't care what they draw. 
Yugi had six cards from Battle City that are still exclusive to the anime, and I'd want to try just about every one of them. First up, Brave Attack, a normal spell card which targets one monster you control, and that monster gains attack equal to the combined attack of all other attack position monsters you control, and it has to attack one of your opponent's monsters this turn. Then, at the end of the battle phase, all of your attack position monsters are destroyed. Big OTK energy on this one, but you either have to fully commit or not bother attempting because if it fails, you're in for a world of hurt next turn. Necromancy is a normal spell card that when I read its effect, you may be just like me in thinking that this was a Kaiba card. Select up to four random monsters from your opponent's graveyard and special summon them in face-up defense position on your opponent's side of the field. If a monster is special summoned by this effect is destroyed, all face-up monsters your opponent controls lose 600 attack for each of these monsters until the end phase. What am I playing, Chaos Max Turbo? Because this card fits right in that wheelhouse. But just like Brave Attack, if you're going to activate an effect that puts a potential four materials for extra deck monsters on your opponent's field, it'd be best to ensure that you can get rid of them all before your opponent's next turn or else you're going to be more than dissatisfied with the outcome. In the ancient times of Yu-Gi-Oh, so the late 1900s, we saw several monster cards whose artwork was simply a recoloring of another existing monster at a different angle. And I was surprised to find that Yugi had an exclusive spell card which did just that. Cursebreaker, a normal spell card whose artwork is an extremely lazy recolor of D-Spell, what does it do? Negate all spell cards and spell card effects activated by your opponent until the end phase. Holy smokes, it's better than D-Spell by a mile. It's even a better cold wave being completely one-sided. When are we getting this, Konami? Quit beating around the lock. Who am I kidding? The card we're most likely to get is themed around Dark Magician, with Magician Selection, a normal trap, activate only when a face-up spellcaster type monster you control is selected as an attack target. Negate the attack and destroy one face-up monster your opponent controls that has the lowest attack. If it's a tie, you get to choose. We already have Sakuretsu Armor and several cards that share its effect, but I say again, this will be the first card we get imported to the TCG from this video solely because it's tied to Dark Magician. And for that reason, I dislike it immensely. But one card that I don't dislike whatsoever is Graceful Charity. It's my top pick for a card that should come off the ban list, and Yugi had the perfect card to combo with it, probably ensuring that it won't come off the ban list. Disgraceful Charity, how innovative, is a normal trap card that allows both players to add all cards from their graveyards that were discarded by the effect of a spell card activated this turn to their hands. I don't think it's that bad. You're going plus one off a two card combo when every meta deck goes plus three off a one card starter. Yugi's final card is probably the most cracked in his showcase for Battle City at least because his Waking the Dragons deck is ridiculous. Spell Textbook, a quick play spell card with the following effect. Discard all cards in your hand, if any. Shuffle your deck, then draw one card and reveal it. If that card is a spell card, activate it immediately. The top deck of all top decks. Because of the inclusion of that if any phrase, you're able to go hand neutral with no other downside or restrictions if you draw anything that isn't a spell card. I can already hear the Exodia players looking for their mother's credit card. Feel free to drop the information in the comments section. I want to congratulate you on making it this far into the video as we move on to our final set of anime exclusives from Seto Kaiba. It's a doozy. Starting with his only monster, Sword of Soul, a level 4 light fairy effect monster with 0 attack and 1900 defense. And when this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can have one face up monster you control gain 1000 attack until the end phase. Cold start if I've ever seen one, just run Acts of Despair. Does anyone remember the card Supply Squad? I, among many players, thought that this card was going to be a genuine problem in the tournament scene upon its debut, but to say that it underperformed would be an understatement. And Charm of Lamentation, a continuous spell card, would have suffered in the same fashion. Each time a monster you control attacks an opponent's monster and that monster is not destroyed by battle, draw one card. On paper, it sounds good. Put this in a deck of small, indestructible monsters who have no chance of getting over anything your opponent plays and start to reap the benefits of multiple extra draws. In application, you'll quickly find that you've OTK'd yourself by attacking into your opponent's Dragon Master Knight with Spirit Reaper. Your thirst for victory will never be quenched. Let me help you with that. Thirst for Compensation is a quick play spell card which can only be activated when your opponent adds a card to their hand by card effect. You can then special summon up to two level 4 lower monsters from your hand in face up defense position. And those monsters cannot change their battle positions or be tributed for a tribute summon. 
Has Monarchate always been this prevalent? Have mercy. Requirements for this card's activation are negligible at best, where every meta deck searches during both players' turns, and two free bodies for whatever extra deck monster you need at the time is fantastic. Truthfully, it just continues to get better from here. Command Silencer is a quick play spell card which can be activated in response to your opponent's monster declaring an attack. That's a new one. That attack is negated, then you draw one card. Did you really have to add that last part? An attack negation on a quick play spell card of all things is good enough. But drawing a card on top of that is just insult to injury. And this card is even easy to get to with Spell Sanctuary, a continuous spell. When you activate this card, each player can add one spell card from their deck to their hand. While this card is face up on the field, players can activate spell cards on their opponent's turn. Another example of a card that would be banned as soon as it's announced for the next Animation Chronicles because holy moly that's broken, any spell card is ridiculous. Normally you have to lose an arm for that kind of effect. The addition of spell cards being able to be activated during either player's turn isn't even that awful of a drawback because the turn player still has priority. It doesn't turn every spell into a quick play. This is a lot to take in. And Seto Kaiba's final exclusive card and the final exclusive card of this week's episode might single-handedly have the most laughable name in comparison to its actual effect. Power Balance, a normal trap card with the following effect. Activate only when you have no cards in your hand. Your opponent discards half the cards in their hand. Then, you draw cards equal to the number of cards your opponent discarded. Kaiba, you have an awfully skewed definition of the word balance, and I love you for that. This is insane. Unless you're playing against Dark Worlds, discarding half of your opponent's hand is not an issue. Going first, after you dump your entire hand into your end board with a nonsense lurking in the back row, you now have a more busted version of Delinquent Duo. I'm shook to the core. So, if you recall from the last episode, I made a brief mention that the speed duel boxes may be a good way to incorporate some of these oddball cars from the early anime. But after looking at these cards, I'd like to formally retract that statement. Some of these are just beyond too much for Speed Duel's limited format, even if that means we can finally play them in the proper TCG. But that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! Guys. Let me know your thoughts. If you liked the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV, signing off.